I will now call the hearing to order. In this time of fiscal belt tightening, too many of America's small businesses are faced with unfortunate choices, either cut costs or close their doors. Taking measures such as de delaying plans to expand and even cutting their own salaries, small business owners have done their best to weather in these trying times. For a majority of small businesses, however, one of the costs they've been unable to trim has been the fees they pay in order to accept card payments from their customers. These fees, commonly known as interchange fees, are paid to banks and card processing networks every time a consumer swipes their card and makes a purchase. While on average these fees are 2 to 3 percent of a transaction's total, the costs can add up quickly for a small business owner. The recently passed financial reform law includes a provision that gives the Federal Reserve the authority over these fees for the first time. The use of debit card purchases has grown steadily in recent years as consumers have made increased use of debit cards in lieu of cash or checks. Under the new law, the Fed is responsible for setting reasonable and proportional rates for debit transactions. While small businesses expect to experience relief from the fees they currently pay for these transactions, small financial institutions, such as community banks and credit unions, have expressed concern that providing the Fed with this new authority could have long-term unintended consequences. Among those concerns is that these small financial institutions will ultimately be put at a competitive disadvantage against large card issuers and will be unable to match the fees set by the Fed for larger issuers, which could ultimately result in fewer services for consumers at these financial institutions that are integral to communities in western Pennsylvania and across the country. Today we will delve into these issues and take a first look at how new reforms enacted under the Wall Street Reform Act will affect American businesses, financial institutions, and consumers. Just two years ago, debit, credit, and prepaid cards surpassed the use of cash and checks as consumers' preferred form of payment. And today these cards are used in more than 56% of all transactions. Electronic cards have always been a convenient means for payment for customers. They expedite transactions while providing the considerable ease of use and security. Today, nearly two-thirds of all customers carry cards that provide some type of reward when they're used. It should come as no surprise, then, that that card usage is on the upswing. As card usage has grown, so too have the amount of interchange fees paid by retailers. According to the Federal Reserve estimates, these fees more than doubled in the five-year period between 2002 and 2007. Today, it's estimated that these fees comprise a $45 billion annual expense for our nation's businesses. For businesses that operate on razor-thin profit margins, fees on card transactions can mean the difference between a profit and a loss each time they sell their goods. Even more troubling is the fact that this cost may fall disproportionately on small businesses since they often lack the market power to negotiate lower fees, as many large retail businesses do. However, payment cards also offer merchants a number of benefits. By accepting card payments, businesses can increase their sales and reach a wider customer base, including expanding into online mail order sales. These cards have added benefit of providing merchants with guaranteed payment that is less prone to fraud, loss, or theft. Merchants also avoid the costs associated with handling cash, processing checks, and transporting funds to a bank when they accept card payments. Most importantly, however, the existence of national card payment networks means that every business in the country, regardless of its size, can sell its goods and services on credit cheaply and efficiently. Two decades ago, that was practically unheard of. Today, it's commonplace, and the interchange system has made all that possible. Rarely does such a seemingly small issue have such a significant impact on the daily affairs of small businesses, small financial institutions, and customers alike. For this reason, it will be imperative that Congress and this committee tread carefully in this area, as even a slight change to the system can have far-reaching consequences. That's what this hearing is about today. Last month, Congress took its first steps toward reforming the card payment system with provisions enacted under the Wall Street Reform Act. Today's hearing will likely be the first of many discussions to examine how these new rules will impact American businesses and customers and give us crucial insights into how these laws can best be implemented. 
small financial institutions like credit unions and community banks were not the cause of the financial freefall we experienced in two thousand and eight or the impetus for the wall street reform act while congress was forced to bail out the bad actors on wall street credit unions and small businesses remain stable as we move forward with implementation of the new law it's critically important that we do not intentionally do harm to do not unintentionally do harm to the small financial institutions that have played by the rules i'd like to thank our witnesses for their participation in today's hearing i look forward to your testimony and uh, as we wait uh, for a ranking member in the interest of time we will just move forward with the hearing and i will introduce starting with mr newton our witnesses I, i'll read about all of you first and then we'll we'll go to the testimony so the bios for the four of you and thank you all for being here mr chris newton is the president of the texas petroleum marketers and convenience store association located in austin texas tpca was formed in 1949 as the texas oil jobbers association to serve the regulatory legislative and educational needs of fuel and the lube oil business so I changed my mind. Why don't we just go ahead with Mr. Newton first, and then we'll introduce all of you. Welcome, Mr. Newton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, my name is Chris Newton, and I appreciate this opportunity to talk about the impact of interchange fees on small businesses. As you alluded to, uh, I am the president of the Texas Petroleum Marketers and Convenience Store Association, or TPCA. TPCA is a trade association representing fuel distributors and fuel retailers in Texas. Our members own, operate, and supply around 10,000 retail motor fuel outlets. Um, our members are also responsible, collectively responsible for the sale of about two thirds of all of the fuel sold in Texas. Um, interchange fee is, is a very important issue to our member companies. Um, and it's, it's important because that it has a significant impact on small business because these fees in our opinion are anti-competitive. They're anti-competitive because the fees are centrally set by Visa and MasterCard and their member banks. Um, there is an incentive to continue raising the fees to attract more member banks. Um, the fees are hidden and consumers are unaware of, their, of the fees escalation. Uh, we also see there's, that there's no price advantage for lower priced cards. Uh, there's no ability to discount for cash. Uh, in fact, a recent study uh, concluded that without higher, inter higher prices caused by fees above and beyond cost plus a reasonable rate of return, Consumers would have an extra $26.9 billion and potentially add 242,000 jobs to the economy. Uh, for our industry, for the convenience store industry, the fees are our members' second highest cost behind labor. But unlike our other costs, we can't do anything about these fees. Um, they've increased dramatically over the last 13 years. Because we have no ability to negotiate these fees or offer our customers a lower priced alternative, there's nothing we can do. Um, the fees impact on small business also becomes more egregious when you consider that our retail profit margins average under 2%, while the Federal Reserve of Kansas City has concluded that the profit margins for interchange fees are around 60%, excuse me, 60%. And to further give you some additional context for this, in 2009, our entire industry made pre-tax profits of $4.8 billion, but we paid fees to process car transactions of $7.4 billion. Uh, this inverse relationship between fees and profits stymies economic growth. The Durbin Amendment to the Financial Reform Bill recently passed by Congress will help small businesses and consumers cope with the Im impact of interchange fees and lead to additional economic growth. Consumers will benefit because the amendment will allow my members to reward lower cost means of payment with lower prices. Uh, small businesses, my members will benefit because we, it, we will receive an assurance that interchange fees for debit transactions will be reasonable and proportionate to their cost. We will have the ability to offer our customers discounts for more efficient means of payment or lower cost means of payment. Um, and lower prices for consumers mean more sales for our members. So that concludes my opening remarks. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and uh, look forward to the discussion. Mr. Salashi, is that correct? Salaski, sorry. Mr. Ron Salaski is Vice President of Lending with the Clearview Federal Credit Union based in Moon Township, Pennsylvania. 
Clearview Federal Credit Union has 76,877 members and assists and assets of $594 million. Clearview primarily serves the Pittsburgh metro area, though it also has branches in Philadelphia and Charlotte. Welcome. Look forward to hearing your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Uh, as you mentioned, I am Ron Salaski, Vice President of Lending at Clearview Federal Credit Union. Uh, just a little background on, on the credit union. We initially served the employees of U.S. Airways and modified our charter back in 2004 to serve communities in a 10-county area surrounding Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, so our charter is a little bit expanded. I do appreciate the opportunity to present our views on interchange, what it means to small businesses, and also what it means to my credit union. Uh, to begin with, we are very concerned with the provisions of the recently enacted financial reform law, which relate to interchange fees. At many credit unions, it's true that interchange revenue covers the cost of providing debit card access to their members. However, for our credit union, that is simply not the case. Last year, our total expense for offering a debit card access or program to our members was $2.9 million. The offsetting debit-based interchange income was roughly $1 million, causing us a shortfall of $1.9 million on a valuable service. How is this possible when merchants have been telling Congress that interchange fees are unreasonable? Clearview Federal Credit Union has an aging membership. And it's true that older members tend to use their debit cards uh, less frequently than the younger members that we serve. In a recent survey conducted by the Credit Union National Association, credit unions reported an average number of transactions per, credit or per card per member at 160 per year. At Clearview, that number is only 69. So even though our members use, our debit use their debit cards with less frequency than members of other credit unions, we still incur the, the total costs of running and administering a program. We run our debit program at a loss because it provides a valuable service to our members. However, any reduction in interchange income that we receive will requ require us to impose fees on members to make up for that lost revenue, and that is a direct result of the recently enacted financial reform bill. The new debit interchange law inc includes an exemption or a carve-out for card issuers with less than $10 billion in assets, like our credit union. However, this exemption provides me with little comfort. And why? Quite simply, about 80% of debit volume is accounted for by a handful of large issuers. The scale of their transactions enables the operation of a global network with enough capacity so that small issuers like us can participate. It's hard to imagine a carve-out that would protect our credit union from the impact of new interchange regulation and the loss of revenue. We don't know how precisely how the system will change and in what ways, but we do know this, that an artificial marketplace will be created. The ability of small issuers to compete in the face of merchant, merchant pressure will be significant. The ability of small issuers to, to attract and retain customers will change and merchants will become even more bold in their efforts to steer and influence com consumers regarding payment methods. Another as aspect of the new law addresses the routing and processing for card transactions. No exemption or carve-out currently exists for small financial institutions uh, applying to the routing section of the law. In practice, this takes the routing decision away from the financial institution and places it in the hands of merchants. And the significance of that is the merchant's objective is to cut the cost to the bottom line, while the financial institution's objective is the security of the consumer's personal information and that transaction. With this new law, the merchant's objection, or, or objective clearly trumps the best interest of the computer, uh, to the consumer, in our opinion. That brings me to my second point. What will this interchange law mean to the small business, businesses in my community? As a credit union len lending officer, I'm very familiar with the challenges facing small businesses today. The inter interchange expenses incurred by small businesses are relatively insignificant compared to expenses associated with health care costs, vendor and supplier expenses, franchise-related requirements or expenses, and certainly a difficult economy. In my experience within the credit union movement since 1991, uh, I've yet to witness a business close based on uh, elevated interchange expenses. But will the new debit interchange structure benefit big box retailers? You bet it will. The Wall Street Journal recently reported a new debit the new debit interchange law will, on an annual basis, 
mean a quarter of a billion dollars for Walmart. Someone needs to support this system. And if the buck is passed from the big box retailer to the consumer, Walmart wins big. And the same can't be said about the consumer in Main Street small business. And my final point, what actions can Congress take today that will truly help small businesses in our struggling economy? I think all of us come from different backgrounds, but we can agree upon the fact that there is a need to increase the amount of credit available to small businesses. There's legislation in place to increase the cap on credit union member business lending, and it has strong support in the House and Senate, and key administration support as well. Pending legislation would increase the credit union member business lending cap from 12.25% of total assets to 27.5%. If this language were enacted this year, credit unions could lend to small businesses an additional $10 billion and create 100,000 new jobs in the first year after enactment at no cost to taxpayers. With ba while bank business lending has contracted in recent years, credit union business lending has expanded. Clearview Federal Credit Union is committed to helping the small business members in our community. In fact, our average business loan is approximately $70,000 and includes, among others, hair salons, landscaping companies, and several other sole proprietorships. It's my hope that Congress will act as soon as possible on this important issue. Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Clearview Federal Credit Union is proud to serve the citizens and small businesses of West, uh, Western Pennsylvania. And at this time, or after the other folks are finished, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness is Mr. Robert Oler. He's the president and chief executive officer of Dollar Bank, headquartered in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Dollar Bank is a full-service regional bank operating more than 50 branch offices and loan centers. Mr. Oler is testifying on behalf of the American Bankers Association, which was founded in 1875 and is the voice for the nation's $13 trillion banking industry and its 2 million employees. Welcome, Mr. Oler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for this opportunity. As you said, I am President and CEO of Dollar Bank, a traditional mutual bank that has served Western Pennsylvania and Northeastern Ohio for over 150 years. Any changes to the interchange system will impact all small businesses, small banks included. The vast majority of banks in our country are community banks, small businesses in their own right. In fact, over 3,200 banks and 6,100 credit unions have fewer than 30 employees. When merchants choose to accept payment cards, they pay a small fee for the many benefits that come with, accept with accepting electronic payments. For example, a $10 debit transaction would cost a merchant less than 10 cents in interchange. In return, retailers typically see more customers, shorter wait times at the register, immediate payments to their account, and less hassle and risk of managing cash. They also generally transfer the risk of fraud to the bank. These interchange fees pay to support a system that works 24-7, 365 days a year, almost, <coughs> excuse me, almost anywhere in the world. These fees are under attack by retailers yet they are no different than any other costs of running a business. Restrictions on interchange fees were included in the recently enacted Dodd-Frank Act. The provision called the Durbin Amendment requires the Federal Reserve to dictate the pricing of interchange on debit cards. The Durbin Amendment, which was added to the bill without any hearings, limits consideration of many important costs of providing debit cards and does not even allow for a reasonable return on investment. Such uneconomic pricing will hurt my ability to offer reasonably priced banking products to consumers and small businesses in my community. Let me illustrate this. Last year, we processed 16 million debit card transactions and made less than $3 per month for each debit card. This revenue is important, but does not cover our costs of maintaining a transaction account, which runs between $12 and $15 a month. Without this income, it becomes very difficult for many banks to continue to offer low and no-cost checking for our customers. The loss of revenue has other impacts as well, including making it harder to make loans. This is even more pronounced for Dollar Bank. Since we are a mutual, the only way we can raise capital is through retained earnings. If we lose interchange income, it means we'll be unable to make as many loans in our community. In fact, if we would see a 50% reduction in after-tax income on interchange, it means 200 fewer small business loans that can be made each year, year after year. For the industry as a whole, a 50% loss of interchange income would mean that lending could fall by as much as $74 billion. 
Congress recognized that setting price controls on interchange fees will have a significant negative impact on roughly 16,000 small banks and credit unions. Congress attempted to remedy, remedy this problem by providing an exemption to the price controls for small banks. While this idea sounds good, there is no, no community banker that believes such an exemption will work in practice. As with any price controls, there are inevitable, inevitable unintended consequences, market distortion, and higher costs for others, including consumers. While I realize the ink is barely dry in the Dodd-Frank Act, the negative consequences for banks and bank customers are so great that Congress should revisit and repeal this provision. Moreover, Congress should avoid further price controls, such as a restriction on credit card interchange fees. Government price setting of business-to-business -business transactions hurts the ability of local banks to serve consumers and local businesses. It affects banks in low-income communities looking to provide low-cost banking services to the underprivileged, and it stifles innovation in a system that has supported the development of electronic bill payment, the online retail market, and the promotion of enormous operational efficiencies for small businesses. Thank you for the opportunity to present the ABA's views. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Oler. Our last witness is Mr. Jerry Buss. He's president of Aurora Huts LLC based in Sevenfield, Pennsylvania. Mr. Buss is the former COO of Pizza Hut, bought 53 Pittsburgh area Pizza Hut locations, making the company one of the largest Pizza Hut restaurant operators in the region. Aurora Huts owns roughly two thirds of the Pittsburgh market's locations. Welcome, Mr. Buss. Could you pull the microphone closer for the stenographer? It's only a couple sentences. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Altmaier and members of the committee. Good morning. I'm honored to be here today to offer my perspective on credit card and debit card fees and how they um, affect my small business. I want to thank Chairman Altmaier for his leadership on this subcommittee and for giving us all the chance to hear our views. I ask that my entire testimony be made part of the hearing record. As Chairman Altmaier said, I operate now 55 Pizza Huts in Western Pennsylvania. We employ around 1,300 employees and we have a payroll of a little over $10 billion. The business is a family business as my children are also owners and operators of this business. And it is my desire to see this business grow and flourish and furnish an opportunity for them to have a lifelong satisfaction of being private business persons. Franchisees like myself and the actual restaurant owners operate most of the restaurants across the country. There are 6,500 pizza, hut, pizza huts, for instance, and almost all of them are operated by franchisees. And I believe that my views match the business model and customer payment realities for our, fra excuse me, our franchisees nationwide. My restaurants are mostly located in small towns with populations of two to 10,000. In fact, we recently opened a new location in Mars, Pennsylvania in early 2008, and we pumped a million eight in development of that location and employed another 30 employees. We, in, in that respect, we do not have to watch the evening news to understand the state of our economy. My customers, my employees, and I are all at the front end of the economy. Every store closing, every layoff, every tax regulation, and yes, every missed mortgage payment directly affects all of us. At the same time, every new hire, every new business opening, and every new customer gives us a bit of optimism that we will pull through this. Congress has given merchants a lift. You have laid groundwork to help us create a competitive market where no market forces prevail. Let me be clear. I am pro-card and pro-bank. Both credit cards and debit cards are key forms of payment and are vital to the modern commerce. Here's the scope of my problem with interchange fees. In 2008, and roughly about 50% of my income comes through cards, in 2008, about $15 million represented fees of 345000 or 2.252% of my sales. As we look at 2010, and as of July 17th, I had about $10 million in cards, uh, of money generated through cards and fees, and I paid $249,000, or 
or 2.443. That's an increase over two and a half years of 8.5% in my fee charges. Under the new rules, I'm assuming that those fees will be more competitive and be reduced. Much, and much has been said about where that money will go. Will it go to the consumer or will it go in the merchant's pocket? I want to reinvest in my business as I believe all private entrepreneurs do. To kind of give a demonstration of how we did this, this year for the last eight months, we have reduced our prices to the consumer in a $10 any large pizza. That's $10 any pizza, any toppings, and it's a discount of over $8. We ran that for over eight months and we do believe that the community in our neighborhoods enjoyed that, thought well of it, and we picked up traffic to offset some of that. I believe that as we do multiple efforts and we look for volume relationships, that we can have reduced costs, all right? If I could uh, just save the project, uh, the money uh, off of what we think the cost of raising in uh, 2010 would be, that would be $20,000. That would supply part of equity for a new building. It could be the addition of new menu items. It could be the revamping of our merit system for our employees. There are plenty of places within the economy other than the entrepreneur's pockets that that would go. In fact, the word greedy has been used, and I would say if you're truly greedy, you're gonna be doing those things and growing your business. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Mr. Buss, and as a resident of your area, I can tell you that that $10 pizza deal does in fact make a difference. <laughs> I have two kids and, and we have uh, kept you in business, helped keep you in business. Well, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Th thank you all. Th this has been very instructive and as you can see from the turnout we have among the, uh, the public here to watch the hearing, this is an issue that has drawn great interest and the Wall Street reform bill of course had any number of, of items in there that drew great public interest. But I will tell you in the two years leading up to passage of that bill, there's no issue that I heard more about from more different people and coming from more different angles than the interchange fee. And that is the purpose of this hearing, is to bring you here and the entire committee will benefit from your testimony. As you can see from the diversity of testimony, this was not an attempt to skew uh, what we were gonna hear. We wanted to hear all sides of the debate and you, you have done great in, in representing all sides. And I wanted to begin by asking each of you the same question just to put in perspective what we're talking about and maybe the different opinion on the same question. And it's, it's very simple. Most people in the country when they go shopping, whether it be in Texas or, or Pennsylvania or wherever, generally most would go to a chain uh, grocery store of some sort. We have Giant Eagle and, and Shop and Save and others in Western Pennsylvania. I don't know if you have Publix or, or Safeway or what, what Texas has. Um, but if, if you go out for an outing with the family, and of course this bill only pertains to debit cards, and some of you alluded to the, the way that's gonna affect credit cards as well, but I'm gonna ask the question on credit cards for that reason. If you go out, you have dinner at a restaurant, a chain restaurant, you go shopping at the grocery store, maybe buy some gas at the corner gas station, use your credit card each time. What is the impact to the consumer from this regulation once, say a year from now, when, once this is fully in play and everyone has adjusted how they're gonna, gonna adjust, what, what am I and my family gonna see changed as a consumer for our credit card purchases for that evening of having uh, bought the, those three different items? Mr. Buss. Yeah, I, I think you would see um, on our behalf uh, an altering of the offerings and the prices that we have to charge for those offerings. We, we are very um, sensitive to the um, uh, average check cost of our um, customers and we try to lower that every possible way we can. So we'll pay more? No, less. Less? Less. Okay, Mr. Oler. I think what you'll see, uh, many cards today come with some sort of rewards attached to them. Uh, they also tend not to have fees. I think if anything is altered along those si uh, lines, uh, the rewards will uh, begin to disappear as well as we'll be looking uh, as we once did when credit cards were in their infancy, uh, annual sort of fees uh, uh, to carry the card with you. So we may not see more each time we use the card, but we'll pay more to have the ability to access that card. That's correct, yes. Okay. Mr. Celastio? 
I, I would agree with Mr. Oler, and I would also add that you are going to see um, on the consumer side probably higher interest rates to make up for the lost revenue that, that the institutions will be getting as a result of the Financial Reform Act. Um, you know, in our case, at least on the debit side, we're looking at slicing that revenue in half and creating even a, a larger deficit, which we would have to pass on the cost to our members, um, which is something we're certainly averse to doing. You mean pass on the costs in their accounts, not just in the use of the Not in their con additional fees, uh, higher interest rates, rates potentially on the credit card side and even on our lending side, which it puts us at a competitive disadvantage. Okay. Mr. Newton. I think what you'll see when you – wait a minute. Sorry. Go ahead. I think what your family will see when they pull up to the gas station is that if they're using a debit card, uh, there may be a choice to use debit or credit and there may be cost savings associated with the use of debit. Um, those cost savings stem not only from ensuring that debit interchange fees are reasonable for and proportionate, but also stem from the fact that the financial reform bill has a provision in it allowing merchants, I think they uh, can select one of two networks in which to process the card from. One of the big issues right now in our industry is that there are instances where Visa MasterCard will say, this particular debit card can only go through this particular network, and that may be at a higher fee. Mm -hmm. And so the Durbin Amendment and the Financial Reform Bill limits that to a certain extent and says, no, you, you can't discriminate amongst these networks. So there may be a cheaper alternative, and I think, especially as it pertains to gasoline, you will see our industry you know, doing all they can to bring those efficiencies to the marketplace to attract more consumers and hopefully lead to more sales. Yep. Thank you. And I, and I asked that question. L let me just say, first of all, Mr. Buss, you asked that your testimony in total be included in the record. And I wanted to say, for the record, all of your written testimony will be included in total in, in the record for the committee. Uh, I, I asked my first question so that Mr. Oler and Mr. Slasky could, could answer this question. The amount of interchange a business pays can vary widely from one business to another, as you both mentioned. But small businesses in general pay more in interchange fees than retail giants like Walmart and Target, which you referenced. How would you propose we address this discrepancy in the Congress to provide small businesses with greater fairness in how these fees are set? What recommendation would you have? We tend to mainly deal with small businesses, and, and our card, uh, you know, our fees are established uh, you know, through the, uh, the network. Uh, so uh, our fees tend to uh, to be the same across the board. Uh, so we really haven't negotiated any separate deals with uh, big box retailers. What about uh, on behalf of the American Bankers Association when you when you would have banks that have maybe a larger scope than that? Is there a different spin to that? Well, I think what would happen if there if there is the ability to uh, to have different fees for, for different institutions based on their usage, uh, uh, I think the customer would be at a disadvantage, uh, you know, depending on the card they hold. For instance, if the big banks uh, uh, are able to uh, have the discount and the small banks uh, uh, would not, uh, would be our card would be disadvantaged to that retailer. Uh, so thus, uh, there might be some, uh, some reason for the retailer to try to uh, to move the customer to another type of card or suggest another type of card uh, so they can maximize their revenue. Right. Mr. Slasky, do you want to comment on that? Yes. We, we don't believe that the, the proposed two-tier system, if you will, um, in practice is something that's viable. We believe that the 80 percent volume that I mentioned by a handful of issuers does not uh, motivate that group to a tier two-tier two issue. Uh, they would want to keep it at a one tier, uh, one tier, one rate tier, if you will, and that puts us again at a disadvantage in our small businesses as well as our individual members as well. Right. I wanted to follow up with Mr. Oler. Uh, over the past decade, as I referenced, with the steady growth in the number of credit card payments and the decline in the cost due to technology advances, one could reasonably expect the cost of processing card payments would fall given those two factors. Why then have interchange fees increased so significantly during that same period? The, 
costs of business uh, always go up. I, I don't think it's been usurious, the increases. It's just a, a matter of maintaining a system, as I said, that operates 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, the system itself always requires uh, upgrades, new software, new controls. Uh, uh, fraud situation has increased uh, over the years. Uh, we've had some breaches in, in uh, uh, cards that uh, the cards have to be reissued and so on and so forth. So I think the increased cost helps compensate uh, for that end of the business. Okay. Uh, Mr. Buss, some have argued that capping interchange fees could result in a contraction in credit availability and a reduction in the number of rewards programs that over 80 percent of consumers currently enjoy. You heard both of our witnesses answer uh, recently to that. Is there a risk that these consequences could then lead to a decline in sales for small firms and outweigh any savings that a rate cap would generate in the outset? Uh, yes, I believe that any time um, we see any increases on the ability to use the cards, uh, that you're going to see um, some contracting on it. Yep. Mr. Newton, did you want to comment on that? If I may, could you rephrase the question? Certainly. Uh, it deals with the rate cap. Well, it, it deals with the rewards programs that we were talking about. Is there a risk that the reduction in rewards the, and that those consequences could lead to a decline in sales for small firms and outweigh any savings that that rate cap would generate? You know, I, I really don't think so. This morning's uh, Wall Street Journal reports that Visa saw a 14 percent increase in the third quarter in credit card transactions. The majority of Visa's uh, network, I'm sorry, the majority of Visa transactions are debit cards. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of choice out there, and I think as consumers are given those choices, they're going to make intelligent decisions about which way to go. I think right now we have a system where, and this is an example from my office, um, one of my uh, employees opened a checking account with the bank and got a debit card from the bank saying, here's your debit card. And on the debit card, on the pay piece of paper that it came with, it said, please, when you go to a retail marketplace, tell the retailer to ring the sale up as credit signature. Credit signature is obviously a much higher rate than PIN, it was a debit card, than PIN debit. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, we will then give you 450 reward points. So there is an incentive to steer the consumer to a higher priced fee transaction, even though signature credit is much more prone to fraud and less secure than using, uh, excuse me, than, than using a PIN debit. And so that's one of the issues that I think the Durbin Amendment, I know the Durbin Amendment addresses, and I think that's to everybody's good. And do you have the ability right now to incentivize cash and check transactions from the it's consumer? It, it, it's hard to answer. I know that the Durbin Amendment, ex Durbin Amendment explicitly authorizes discount for cash. Uh, another anecdote from Texas, if you'll bear with me. Uh, one of my members um, attempted to offer um, gasoline, to offer a discount for cash for people who use gasoline. And a representative of Visa or MasterCard happened to be driving down the road and pulled into the store and said, what are you doing? Um, and he said, well, I want to give people a discount for cash. He had contacted me. I discussed it with uh, staff from our state AG's office, and they said under Texas law, it's discounting permitted. The representative of the card company said, absolutely not. It's against our rules. He called me and asked me about it. I said, well, I ask him to show you the rule, and then we can distribute it to members of our association just saying you need to be aware of this compliance issue. Uh, he then claimed, the Visa MasterCard person claimed that I can't show it to you. But, it, but trust me, it's against, the, uh, it's against the rule. So this merchant was left with the choice of, okay, do I discount for cash and run the threat of Visa MasterCard knocking me out of the system and suspending my access to the network, uh, or do I continue to offer this discount for cash? And he chose to not continue that practice because he was afraid, and I think all retail merchants are afraid of that threat because Visa MasterCard control, I believe it's 80% of the market. Thank you. I wanted to get back to our witnesses from the credit union and, and bank side and uh, start with Mr. Oler. Under new provisions of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act, merchants will have the right to offer discounts not only for cash but also for checks and debit cards. Will these changes in the law have an effect on credit card use as you see it? 
when we talk about offering discounts, I'll just present uh, our information. As I said uh, uh, in my testimony, we, uh, we had 16 million transactions we processed last year. The average ticket of that transaction or the average transaction amount was uh, right around $35. Uh, when you're looking at uh, debit cards, uh, uh, you're looking at less than 1%. So I guess is it realistic that the retailers would offer a discount of 35 cents, you know, on a transactional basis? Mr. Slasky? As far as um, the discount for cash checks and debit, I, I don't know that it would have that great of an impact solely because the, this, the convenience and the popularity of the debit card transaction, people are more... Um, more likely to carry the debit card than even cash and checks these days as far as a payment processing. So what I, I do believe we would see is, is a decrease in the transactions on the credit side as a result of the discount significantly. T talk about for the two of you and then I'll go to Mr. Newton and Mr. Buss as well. Are there risks that the consumer will be confused or frustrated by having two different prices for goods depending on their chosen method of payment if this were to lead to that? I would believe so because I believe the consumer considers that plastic a credit card, whether it's debit or credit, as their form of payment, regardless of it coming out of their checking account or, or being a revolving line of credit. So there is a risk of confusion. I think one important point to add to all this, too, when we're talking about discounts and uh, reducing the interchange rates is the liability for any fraud or problem on, on the plastic transaction lies with the institution, not the consumer and not the merchant. So those costs have to be um, considered when we talk about the interchange income that we're receiving as well. Mr. Oler? I would agree with, uh, with uh, uh, that comment. Uh, I think we had a huge breach up in the New England area that had uh, ramifications across the country uh, when we had a breach in their card system. Uh, I know we had to reissue uh, several thousand cards ourselves. Uh, there are other members of the ABA that I talked to just last week. Uh, one in particular was a billion dollar institution uh, located out in the Philadelphia area and he had to reissue 10,000 cards. That stuff uh, comes at a, a, a uh, high cost to the institution itself and we bear that cost you know, through the current uh, interchange setup. Uh, Mr. Newton, do you have any concerns about different pricing levels showing the uh, consumer, giving the consumers some confusion? Uh, it's certainly no. I, I trust our members and the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of retailers out there across this country, across all businesses, to con communicate the message uh, uh, and, and to let consumers know of lower prices available for more efficient and more uh, more efficient means of payment. So uh, I think the industry has shown time and time again, especially for the industry that I'm in, gasoline, we, we compete on price. And I, I just don't see it being an issue because I think the consumer expects it and they expect a lower price. And once they become aware of a lower price associated with the use of a debit card when compared to their traditional credit card, I fully expect the entrepreneurs in our association across this country are going to find a way to make sure they're aware of it and uh, that they take advantage of that opportunity. Mr. Buss. Well, I do think it may afford us an opportunity in business to um, attract more consumers. Uh, I am uh, gravely concerned about trying to get that uh, message across that you have several ways to pay and you have different prices with those ways to pay. Um, and for instance, uh, uh, a little over 50% of our uh, revenue comes in um, at home. We deliver to, to the homes. Um, we would have um, a difficulty there with uh, debit cards and because of the pins. Uh, we generally take them as credit cards uh, in that situation. I will add also um, to a little earlier comment um, that you were asking about, and that is I have noticed over the uh, economy slowdown that we have moved off of um, uh, credit cards and debit cards and moved back into more checks from the consumers, at least in the area where I do business and where my fellow franchisees do business. So I do think the consumer has some interest in what's going on with some of this, and I do think they're moving around a little bit more. Okay. Mr. Newton, have you had that same experience in the slowdown with people using checks and cash more often 
than they were in the past? No, with fuel, our members have experienced increased rate, increased usage of both credit and debit. With debit, I'd say that our members in the urban areas, specifically Dallas, Houston, and Austin, see 90% of their transactions are either on credit and debit or debit cards. And of that 90%, 50 to 60 percent are associated or with debit cards. Okay. So I, I think, speaking for the fuel end of it, it is, as, as we've seen the volatility in prices and everything else, um, consumers continue to choose uh, either credit or debit cards. Mr. Chamberlain, may I add something? Certainly, of course. Kind of on a, on a practical basis, I have uh, two sons, 128 and 133, and uh, frankly, uh, they never have cash with them. To them, the cards, are the cash. Right. Uh, so uh, if you ask them for a few dollars, it's, it's uh, you know, they hold a card out, but they, there's not much uh, you can do about <laughs> it. <laughs> I wanted to move to Mr. Buss uh, again. As you know, proponents of maintaining the status quo on interchange fees have characterized the interchange fee as simply one more cost of doing business, not unlike utility or labor costs, and have said that merchants can stop accepting card payments if costs outweigh the benefits. From your perspective, can a business realistically expect to operate without accepting card payments today? Which is a good follow-up from what we just heard from Mr. Irwin. Uh, no, I do, I do not believe that we could. Um, and like with checks, that would probably um, be beneficial to move away from checks and into cards if you could. But we cannot, we, we cannot get that done. We have tried that uh, over the years and not been able to do that. So. Um, uh, no, I, I think in, in our situation, we would take any, any way of payment um, to continue to grow our business. And a question from Mr. Selaski. Did you want to answer something on that? No. Okay. Uh, at a recent conference hosted by the European Central Bank, policymakers and banking experts suggested adopting a card fee system that took into account the cost that businesses would pay to operate their own credit card systems. Do you think that that type of system would have merit in this country? I believe that there should certainly be discussion um, and research into that. Um, any alternative that is consumer friendly and small business friendly, I, I'm in favor of. Uh, I would further say with regard to, to the interchange that we as Clearview Federal Credit Union receive on, for example, a $100 purchase, uh, our revenue would be a, something between $1.30 and $1.50, which in my opinion does not seem excessive or unreasonable. Mr. Eller, do you think that's something we should explore in this country? Uh, if I read correctly about a month ago, I believe Target is actually looking to do that. They're looking to have their own card. And uh, mm -hmm. if you recall, uh, when cards were in their infancy, it used to be that the, uh, the vendors all had their own cards and, and they weren't part of the, uh, the overall network. So uh, it, it's possible you could see some movement back to that. I wanted, sticking with uh, looking at what other countries have done, I wanted to ask Mr. Newton about Australia. I don't know if you're aware that since Australia placed a cap on interchange fees in 2003, their central bank found a sharp decrease in the availability of rewards cards and no conclusive proof of lower prices for consumers. Why do you believe that tighter caps on interchange rates in this country would be met with better results than they saw in Australia? Well, I it's my understanding that that there was a study done by the Australian bank that found that there was perhaps a billion dollars worth of, so there may be two different studies. My, my, my contention in regards, and again speaking from the fuel perspective, is that uh, our industry is extremely price competitive and our members are constantly looking for new ways to attract con consumers or customers to their stores. Um, and so any any means out there available that uh, this new law will put at their disposal, they'll take advantage of. And I think I'm, I'm confident. And I, I would also, you know, bring up the Department of Energy has studied fuel prices and found that 100 percent of the cost decreases are reflected in retail gasoline prices. So I think we have a, a, a solid background of passing on those things. The Hispanic Institute issued a report that went to the same effect that said the same thing because consumers are already paying these fees. Um, so I'm confident that here in the United States there will be some movement as entrepreneurs again take advantage of the, the freedom of choice that this legislation provides. Thank you and I would ask if your association could forward to the committee 
the study that you referenced, because we would love to see any further information. So yes, sir, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Uh, sticking with Mr. Newton, the business community has consistently maintained the high cost of interchanges passed along to consumers and that the federal caps interchange could result in lower cost for goods and services. If interchange fees were capped, what guarantees would we have that those savings would be passed along to consumers? How do we know for sure that's what's going to happen? I, I think you know for sure because it's, it's, it's economics. Um, lower prices mean more sales. So it's to our members' advantage to ensure that they are offering the lowest priced products out there they can to attract consumers to their, to their retail facilities. Um, our market does not allow a, a retailer to sit on margin very long. Um, you can drive through any community and know exactly what we're selling our products for. And so the, just the competitive market forces are not going to allow that. And I think that's really what this bill addresses is that the competitive market forces are not present in how these interchange fees are set. Um, and this bill seeks to remedy that and to ensure that the fees are reasonable and proportionate to offer choice or some semblance of choice when it comes to network processing. Mr. Mm -hmm. Buss, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I would wholeheartedly support that. I do believe that this, uh, the, it, the lower you can drive the prices, the higher you can drive the business. Uh, I, I do think we look for tenths of a percent. May I add, say, may I add something, Chairman? Uh, the Durban Amendment itself uh, does not allow for a reasonable rate of return. So uh, that's going to be an interesting discussion. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, based, on, based on Mr. Slasky, she and myself, you know, we need to make a rate of return too, uh, you know, a combination to stay in business and continuing to lend to the community. So, uh, you know, the fee has to be established to provide a reasonable rate of return. Mr. Slasky, do you want to have a final word on that? I, I would only add that, um, you know, with respect to, to Mr. Newton's comments on, and I have full confidence that he's, his his group would do that, but uh, reduce the cost as as their costs are reduced. Our concern is the the big box retailers, for lack of a better term, who's the police of seeing consumer prices being lowered. There, the, um, does the Fed wash their hands once these tiers are set, and who who talks about consumer prices? And at the end of the day, the consumer and the small business owners run our business. So. Before we conclude, again, the purpose of the hearing was to hear all points of view, and you all did a wonderful job in doing that. And I tried in my questioning, as you saw, to try to give you different uh, perspectives and allow you to answer what some of the criticisms have been from your points of view. So I wanted to end the hearing by allowing each of you, if you choose, you don't have to, based on what we've discussed today, do you have anything else you'd like the committee to consider as we move forward? Is there any point that wasn't brought up or, or rebuttal that you want to make that you wanted to have the opportunity to do. We'll start with Mr. Newton. Uh, let me first say thank you. We appreciate this opportunity to appear before the committee today, and I thought this was an excellent discussion of all the issues. Um, I, I think there's, there, there's not a specific point that I would bring up, but I would, in a, in a more general sense, um, ap applaud the passage of the Durban Amendment because it does seek to reverse the incentives that are present in the market today and to bring some competitive market forces to this, um, which is something that my members deal with every day, and I think that's to the good of the American economy and to the good of the American people. So we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Slasky. In closing, I would only say that the, the benefit to, to the merchant level uh, would be clearly outweighed by the harm done to the the average consumer and the small business. Um, we as a $630 million credit union, I consider us a small business and the impact of the loss of revenue is certainly significant and would have a significant impact on both the credit union, our individual members and our small business members. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to the, to the hearing. Thank you. Mr. Olin. Mr. Chairman, I would also like to thank you. I thought you did a good job in, in being fair uh, across the board. Uh, I would just like to add that uh, whichever way it go whichever way it goes, the consumer, whether they pay indirectly through interchange or directly, uh, if they lose out on free checking, uh, you know, somehow the consumer is going to end up paying for this, and uh, and I think that's going to be the bottom line. I think you've already seen Wells Fargo, as of July 1st, announce that there is no more free checking uh, across their system. 
I think Bank of America is, uh, is exploring different uh, fee structures, uh, so they're heading in that direction. And I think any alteration in the, uh, in the interchange uh, will lead more to go in that direction. Thank you. Mr. Buss. Again, uh, Chairman Altmaier, thank you very much for being here. As I close, I would only ask as we enter this uh, um, phase of federal rulemaking that the Oversight Committee be diligent and ensuring that the final bill that came out is as it was intended and is written. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. This was a great discussion. It's the first of many hearings we're going to have on this topic, but we, I think we moved the ball down the field a little bit. And I now ask unanimous consent that members will have five days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record without objection so ordered. And this hearing is now adjourned.